Dean Urich, and Dr. Brian Gray. Hey, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Great to see you. How are you tonight? Good, Dr. Gray. Good to see you too. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dean Urich. I appreciate it. Well, I wanna thank you and everybody else uh, for joining us on this inaugural event, which is pretty exciting. Um, I want to just share a few words. Um, I'm the Dean on Agricultural Sciences and I've been here at UCR for almost five years and really privileged to uh, lead a college that only not, not only educates students in life, but also in the physical sciences. And, as well as the life sciences and the agricultural sciences. So for many of you who may not realize the fact that you have the life sciences, physical science and agricultural sciences all under one college is very, very unique in the country. So there's a lot going on within the college as well as in the world right now that's affecting our college and our campus as well as our students. So uh, the good news, if there is any good news with COVID, for example, is that we have the opportunity, we've all learned to Zoom, and so we have the opportunity to reach out to people in a very different way that we couldn't have done this before. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Brian this afternoon, uh, or this evening, because Brian is speaking to us, is, is connecting with us from Washington, DC. And um, I just over the last, Few days, I've learned a little bit more about Brian. I'd say one of the things that we have in common, in addition to a love of UCR, we're both the oldest of four people in our family, and we're both first-generation college students. And I think I got this right, that we're both the only ones in our family, not only to get there, to go to college, but to get their PhD. Absolutely. So very, very Congrats. unique, uh, yeah, very unique background. So with that, let's talk some science. So yeah. let's, <laughs> Let's start with uh, a little bit of background, Brian. Um, sure. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and how you ended up in, in Washington, DC? Yeah, sure. So I guess I have to start with the disclaimer that everything I'm about to say is uh, all my own views and my own opinions. They don't represent any of the organizations I'm affiliated with um, or Congress or anything like that. So um, they're all my own and I take full responsibility for that. So I have to get out, that out there. Um, so as Deron mentioned, uh, I'm a double Highlander. I did my bachelor's and my PhD at UC Riverside. I also worked for the campus between my two degrees. Um, and after that, I, I really wanted to get involved in the community, right? I come from a community that's a little less connected and um, has some different challenges. Um, so I got to work in a really amazing job at Harvey Mudd College in the Office of Community Engagement. I was one of the founding um, people there. Uh, we did some really big things, really exciting things. Uh, um, really allowed me to, to get a sense of how to organize at community level. Uh, I got recruited to do a similar position uh, at Columbia University in New York City, um, both of which were amazing experiences. Um, but one of the things I learned about community organizing is communities are trying to enact change, uh, you know, to improve, improve themselves, improve the situation in which, they're, um, in which they find themselves. Uh, and one of the best ways to enact change is to convince policymakers to actually do that. Um, and so I really wanted policy experience I applied for the AAAS, uh, the American Association uh, for the Advancement of Science, uh, Science and Technology Policy Fellowships. I got it, uh, and I went to the National Science Foundation for about a year and a half um, in DC, uh, and then was hired on by the National Science Foundation as a program manager, so I was a federal employee then. Uh, but right around that time, I learned I had an opportunity to go to Congress um, and uh, be a Congressional Science Fellow through the American Institute of Physics, um, but I couldn't turn that down, right? Here was a chance to do policy, like where, where it happens, right, at the federal level. Um, so I'm now a uh, health policy fellow in the Office of Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky of Illinois. So Thank that's you. a little bit about me, um, but I would love to hear more about you. Like uh, you weren't the dean when I got there, so you know, it sounds like there's a lot of exciting stuff going on, but I'd love to hear more about, how, uh, about your own personal and professional background. Well, um... Perhaps like you, it sounds like a little convoluted. I was interested in listening how your background, you started out in what is EEO biology, went to EEOB, but then got associated with a AAAS, but then you were associated through physics. You said the Institute yeah. of Physics. Mm -hmm. so, um, <laughs> so my background, I'm originally from the Dakotas. And so uh, first generation in my family, again, first of four kids. I uh, got my undergraduate degree at University of North Dakota, got my PhD at Cornell, moving uh, eastward, 
Uh, I spent um, some time at MIT as well as Bell Laboratories because I thought I wanted to work in the real world. Realized I really missed teaching and mm. I wanted to go into academics. And so I began my academic career at Rutgers University in New Jersey over almost 25 years ago. So after wow. 20 years there, I realized um, there's this wonderful opportunity at UCR to be Dean of all these uh, amazing sciences. And mm -hmm. it was an opportunity I couldn't turn down because it, it pulled in together my passion for um, really reaching out to people who didn't have the same opportunities as I did, yet built upon this extraordinary foundation of excellent science. So the science that goes on at uh, UCR is, is world class. And so to be able to do both of those is just was something I couldn't pass up. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like an amazing fit. And you know, it sounds like they're, they're, UCR is lucky to have you as well. Ah, well, thank you. Thank you. And I think we talked, I think we made the, the coastal swap in the same, around the same time, right? You came from the East Coast to the West Coast in 2016, and I made the same leap, but in the other direction at the same time. So we, we, we probably almost saw each other with our in the air. tracks moving. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, moving from coast to coast is a big change. Um, yes. I have to admit, and it, it's maybe my North Dakota roots, I still miss, I miss winters, but there's, <laughs> there's no replacement for being able to go outside and, and walk around at any time of the year. Uh, I, I agree. Say, I, and, I mean, even in the time of COVID, right? So there's no, every day I have the opportunity to go out and get some exercise. Um, yes. I'd like to use this opportunity to trans, because you're in DC, you know, you have mm -hmm. a science background. Uh, COVID is such a, a, a critical uh, issue for everybody right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if there's anything you can share with this group um, who may not be aware of how DC pol policymakers are responding to COVID. Because right. we hear a lot of stuff in the news, but I'm sure it's very different from what you're what you're actually getting on a daily basis. Yeah, well, I think the news we it's like the that analogy of like watching a duck swim, right? We see on the surface the duck is like calm, right, and then underneath the surface is all this paddling, right? And I think in the news, like you know, what we see is you know the what happens after a negotiation or after a vote, um, but there's so much that goes into that, right? Um, you know, everyone's like, oh, Congress isn't doing anything. It's like, I, my work schedule doesn't match with that, that view, right? Um, you know, we're constantly busy. Um, you know, one of the big things for uh, the Congresswoman that I work for is, you know, she's really big on making sure that every constituent call, letter, email gets answered. And so we spend a lot of time checking in with constituents, see how they're doing. You know, are they able to get testing? Are they able to get what they need? Um, so that's a big one. But because I work on the health portfolio, um, and I was on that before COVID, right, you can imagine that it's been um, intense, right, in terms of trying to get legislation passed to um, enact relief uh, for the American public, um, because a lot of people are hurting and a lot of people are need support, um, you know, while we try to you know, fight the pandemic. Um, but there's also a lot of material that goes into how do we enact a proper response and give science the, the runway it needs to do what it needs to do. I think one of the things that COVID has highlighted, and there's not been a lot of good out of COVID, but I think one of the you know, if we had to pull a silver lining is we understand the importance of science now, right? Science is what's going to get us out of this pandemic by getting us treatments that work, by getting us hopefully a vaccine that works. Um, but those things don't happen overnight and they don't happen without a massive uh, underlying infrastructure. They don't happen without the talent um, and the, the personnel needed to do those things. Um, we can't test without a workforce. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we have those things running and and having those things uh available right um so i would say that's that's a large part of the day-to-day -day is you know kind of trying to figure out what it is that needs to happen and pushing buttons and pulling levers to make that happen of course all of that happens with the congress people themselves right um so as staff we support them and in, in, as they work on those actions so i'm, I'm going to follow up on this a little bit so sure. um I'm just thinking, so it is, to me, it seems to be a big change. You're going from heavy duty science, right? Yeah. Into policymakers, into policymaking. Um, do you see the benefits? I mean, is it obvious to you on a daily basis or is it something that you look gonna look back on a, a decade from now and say, wow, my PhD really made a difference? Yeah, I mean, yes, and yes to, yes in all forms, right? So the science matters, obviously. Um, 
you know, the work I was doing was, was important and basic research is, you know, I was doing basic as applied to apply, applied research and basic research is important in and of itself, right? It's the fuel by which we generate like in progress. Uh, so that's critical. Um, it wasn't really for me, like I enjoyed it and I was able to pull stuff together, but what I really, really loved was the interaction with people and how do we bridge the connection between research and, and, what's, and what society needs, right? Um, and there's lots of really cool research that does that, but for me, like doing policy and doing community organizing to advocate for the needs of my community and other communities like mine was really important. Um, and I thought that science actually, science fits with that as well. I mean, we live in an era of publicly funded science, right? Mm -hmm. We always talk about like these big foundations like the Gates Foundation, and even if you throw all those foundations together, they fund like a, such a small fraction of what the National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health and the FDA and the EPA and all of these other you know, government agencies fund. And so we live in an era of publicly funded science. And so having scientists there to talk about the importance of science, um, the limits of science, where we can and can't go, what yeah. sorts of things need to happen is, is really critical. Um, but I also think having someone who's done the work um, in at least some fashion, uh, there to say like yes this is how things work or this is the timeline we're, we're thinking about and um you know just to, to add a bit of uh insight in, in terms in the scientific process is really helpful right, thank you so we, we, we started talking about how COVID has shifted things right like i'm, I'm teleworking all the time my schedule seems to have <laughs> expanded um but i imagine COVID is having a big impact at uc riverside so i was kind of hoping you could talk a little more about that impact you know, what's, what's going on with campus? How are students being affected? How are faculty effect, affected? And what's going on with research? Oh my goodness, it changes constantly as you can imagine. Right. So um, the big change for us came on March 13th, which is Friday the 13th. And we were told by the Riverside County Department of Health uh, that uh, we were no longer allowed to be on campus. So there was some ambiguity in that. But this, this is what happened the Friday, on um, the next Saturday, the next day, finals for winter quarter were starting. So wow. imagine what that means for everybody. This announcement comes out on a Friday morning. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you're not gonna be allowed to be on campus anymore. So we scrambled, students scrambled, faculty scrambled, staff scrambled, just to figure out how the heck are we gonna do this to make sure everybody can do the finals or not do the finals? How are we gonna make arrangements? And with that, if we're not gonna be physically allowed to be on campus, we can still work, but not physically. What does that mean for our research? And I'll just say for me, I still have a research lab, a small, just a small group of people. But that means by that following Monday, March 16th, myself and most every other faculty went in and uh, put our, put our uh, it's called putting our labs on CPR, uh, meaning it was critical preservation of research. So if you're feeding animals, if you're feeding plants, if you're feeding your insects, though that kind of research can continue. But everything else starting March 16th was basically off limits. Until we understood what the, a little bit more about the disease, how it was a spread. So really with over a weekend, we went to, everything was completely online. The research was basically put on hold. Uh, we got through the finals, then it was spring break, and then we started for the spring quarter. So the entire spring quarter, we taught remotely, the entire campus, every single class that we had. And on one hand, it was pretty painful, but I have to say it was really phenomenal. Our faculty were truly amazing about doing this turnover on a dime. The students were really good because everybody's kind of struggling to figure out how does this whole thing work? And I don't know if I shared this before, but certainly for this fall quarter, we are planning to go completely remote. So fall quarter starts in October. So we have the opportunity to kind of see how other colleges are doing and how, it, how they're managing it. And so far, a lot of colleges and universities who decided to bring people back are struggling. So we yeah. still, feel, still feel pretty good about that decision. So for the fall, uh, everything is remote. We have some field courses, a couple of selected courses where people, students can come back on campus. And uh, not right now, graduate students and postdocs and faculty in terms of research can be on campus in a very scheduled way uh as being as safe as we possibly can and you know things are going to change on a daily basis as they do mm -hmm. so that's well, where we are safety is critical i mean the the safety component can't be can't be stated you know strongly enough it's so critical to make sure that people are, are safe but also like we want to continue 
you know, the, scrap, the, the important research that helps us respond to pandemics like this. So. Well, I'm thinking of the daily. So you said um, you said something that you're still working just as much as you ever have. So how does has your daily routine changed? Oh my I gosh! Mean, are you, are, <laughs> you're, so that's a no. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, tell, no. So I mean, tell me, how has your daily? What's it? What's it like? Right. What's it like being in DC right now? What's 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 it like? What's it mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I think everybody listening on this call has definitely experienced like massive change in their schedules, right? Um, whether they're going into work or whether they're working remotely, um, our day to day has changed quite a bit. I mean, I think the first thing for me is uh, Congress was never built to be something that works remotely. Um, you know, they don't have any policies and procedures in place really for that. Like it's, it's meant to be a place where people interact with one another, right? People vote on the floor um, and they still do that. Um, so it's, it was definitely a big shift to move people out because you know, the focus was we need to make sure our staff are safe too, because for every congressperson you see, there's a staff of, you know, depending on what district they represent, you know, 15 to 80 people. Like, so there's a lot of other people on the Hill that beyond the, the, the representatives and the senators. Yeah. Um, so there was a big shift to try to get that to happen, but also to still meet all the obligations, right? To, to prep, you know, to prep our representatives for the votes and uh, to take meetings with constituents to, you know, everything has just changed, right? So we're all working remotely. Um, the, you know, the, the day is blurry now. And I think that's something people probably can resonate with. Uh, you know, there's not, there's, there's official times to check in and start doing things, but, you know, we're kind of just working. <laughs> um, and I think I've heard a lot of other people talk about, like, the, the lines between work and, and life have kind of blurred a bit. And that's certainly true for um, everybody working on the Hill as well. Um, but at the same time, there's a, a really a real sense of urgency, right? And I think that's something mm. true for lots of folks. But there's a sense of urgency in terms of how do we get the things that need to happen? How do we you know, provide that runway that I talked about for science uh, and for medical experts to do what they need to do to keep the pandemic you know, in control as much as possible, which hasn't really happened, um, while developing you know, treatments and vaccines, uh, but also to make sure that people have what they need to be safe and secure. Um, and again, like there's been mixed results, but there's definitely a sense of urgency in terms of how do we get these things to people. So it's been um, it's been a it's been a change, but I think that's true for for you as well. Um, so yeah, so what I guess how has your day to day changed, and what what's been like the biggest challenge that you faced uh, during this time? So. <laughs> My daily, uh, having meetings, having discussions with people hasn't changed. I'll just say personally for me, the biggest challenge is, is losing the people connection. I, mm. I miss walking down the hallway. I miss walking down the quad. I miss looking at the bell tower. I miss going to the hub. I miss it. And just running into people and having the opportunity to, to, to hear and catch up and what's going on. Um, and I also think that that's, I mean, that's not, that's me personally, but I think that is really affecting a lot of our students. And, and we'll talk about our faculty, but I just, just since you're an undergrad and graduate student, I'm thinking that sense of community, that ability to network, right. it is just completely different. So when you can't be on campus yet you're doing your research, if you're an undergrad, you don't have that study space anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're an undergrad, you, the study space where you can go and sit and say, okay, so how did you solve this problem? Show it to me and you actually go through, that, that's really valuable. Uh, in that study space, you're also sharing, you know, kind of personal issues and struggles and graduate students. I mean, there's something about that, that personal connection. So those are the challenges that we have on campus, particularly for the students. Um, I'm gonna bounce this because thinking of the positive, what are, what are we learning out of this is we've learned that we can survive on Zoom, that we can communicate on Zoom, uh, that we can hold meetings virtually, that we can have meetings from people uh, across the country. Uh, right. I'm, I'm giving an example, in the spring, I was teaching a class for a learning community, which in the spring is transfer students. And uh, I had the opportunity, because we were doing this by Zoom, uh, one of our faculty members, specifically Dick Schrock, who is a Nobel laureate, who is a UCR alum, he was stuck in Boston. 
And so he can participate and meet with my class. You know, I'm just thinking if we didn't have Zoom, if we didn't have, I don't know if the students would have the same level of interaction. And so they can send, you know, chat and interact with them. It just really opened my eyes to doing things differently. Is it my preference? Probably not, but it's another tool in the toolbox that we could use to do research differently and to, to perhaps teach differently. Oh. Yeah, no, it definitely, you know, generates new opportunities too, right? I mean, with all of the, the negative with COVID, there are some you know, new emerging areas that come out of big, big crises like this. There's bright spots. So we, we, we learned that we can survive. <laughs> we learned that we can teach. We, well, fortunately, many of us survived. I shouldn't be too glib about that because it's been really horrible for a lot of people. But I'm just thinking from the perspective of a college, you know, there's a lot of, if you would have told faculty that you're going to be teaching remotely for the next five or six months and if for the next year, I think people would have just said that's impossible. If you would have told the students that, I think they would have said that's impossible. But it's amazing how resilient people are. When you want to learn and you want to teach and you want to know, you will find a way to make it happen. So I actually want to shift gears a little bit and ask about uh, basically your experiences. Um, knowing what you know now, is there things that CNAS in particular should be thinking about in preparing our students for a post-COVID world? Yeah, I mean, we think a lot about the post-COVID world, right? Um, I, I think it's really important to remember that like a post-COVID world, if we go back to normal, then we have failed in every respect of the word, right? Normal wasn't working for so many people. Um, you know, and COVID has highlighted that, right? You know, there's massive disparities in infection rates, but also in fatalities. Um, we're mm -hmm. seeing you know, the black and the brown community, like the Latinx community, um, people who are essential workers, like they're, they're suffering the brunt of this. Um, and so what COVID has done is really like unmasked a lot of these inequities. Um, so I think you know, a major focus on, on how do we advance equity in all that we do, um, and that's, that's critical in science, right? We know that science historically hasn't necessarily been the most welcoming place for, for lots of individuals, right? Um, and so I think CNAS has, is well positioned to, to actually make a difference there. Um, you know, UCR itself has a very diverse campus um, in terms of its student body. Um, and it's it's in the inland it's in the inland empire, right? And as someone who grew up there, like you know, the inland empire was always one of those kind of I always felt it was one of those forgotten areas of California, right? People think about LA, people think about the Bay Area, and the inland empire shows up as the butt of jokes on shows if it's mentioned at all, right? And here's a chance to really kind of move that conversation and change things. There's a wealth of talent. There's an incredible you know incredible populace there. Um, there's a lot of strengths in the Inland Empire, um, and I, I think UCR has a lot, has, is well positioned to do big things um, simply by working to advance equity. And I think that CNAS can do that as well. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the single biggest thing that needs to happen with our, our post-COVID efforts, right, is how do we advance equity um, and make sure that people have a fair shot at things. So I'll, I'll bring up, uh, there's been a lot of conversations on campus just about equity and also with uh, my scientific professional world. So you'd say science, it's objective, but science is done by people. Right. So science is done by people. We have to be very thoughtful about how we engage, not, not how we do the science, how we share science, how we communicate science and how we value science. So uh, I, I like how you're bringing up both the equity and the science because they're, they're they're similar it's not one or the other so you do good science and you do it in being inclusive so right. you're gonna laugh i mean there's a term that i i've been i heard long ago and i keep thinking of it as inclusive excellence so you're being you're excellent and you're inclusive it's not one or the other you do both so you mm -hmm. do this amazing science yet you do it in a very inclusive way right well, actually, I'm really curious, that, like, so how is CNAS and I guess UCR more broadly um, supporting, you know, students at this time, uh, given that we're, you know, our discussion of like inclusive excellence? Uh, this is a tough one. So, you know, there's, there's the things that you do with that on one on one in terms of student touches. Um, we've been working really hard to reach out to individual students, I could say from from the faculty's perspective. 
uh, faculty have been getting together and noting if, if students are uh, responding in the Zoom classes, right? Because you're teaching by Zoom right now. And so we look for people who don't show up. We look for people who maybe show up but never ask any questions or are not turning in homework. And the faculty, we've had a lot of conversations about working very specifically for them looking out for these people and making sure that they're being as um, that they're being reached out to so mm -hmm. you know typically if you have a physical classroom you know people don't show up or the room is you know doesn't fill up that's one thing but with zoom you need to be careful about that you need to be more thoughtful um yeah it's it's interesting because also i notice for students relative to perhaps your peers they don't always feel comfortable showing their picture on the screen uh, they don't always feel comfortable participating, and I find uh, myself that they're very more—they're much more active in chats, and that's a level that they feel more comfortable with interacting. And there is an age differential there. <laughs> there is a cluster. They love chatting, and they share with each other and share a lot of communication in ways that kind of the folks are perhaps more a uh, little bit more senior do not do it at the same level. So I get to ask your question. For faculty perspective, trying to reach out. Uh, we've also been doing um, a lot of outreach, thinking about how we can financially support our students. We've been doing a lot more. Uh, I don't know if you know aware of this, but probably since your time or the last few years, we've started a pantry called Our Pantry. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a garden called an Our Garden. So with agriculture operations, given the fact that we're growing all this food. You know, it's experimental, but you know, it's still food that you can eat. So how do you take this food, uh, provide it back to students, undergrads and graduate students who are food insecure. So we've been doing a lot on this, this area too. So really it's whatever we can do to support our students who are already amazing, but some of them are also struggling. No, and I, I appreciate that. I think that, that gets really back to the inclusion part, you know, as a first gen student, but also a low income first gen student, right? It was. There were days and, and weeks where sometimes it was really tough to, to make things happen and to you know have a reliable source of income or a reliable source of food even. Um, so any efforts in that, to, and that, that's part of the inclusion, right? We wanna make sure that people, all people have a chance to, to do great research. And sometimes that means being fed. <laughs> I, sp I think I subsisted on oatmeal for weeks and weeks at a time. <laughs> Absolutely. No, we, we learn we learn lots of ways to, to cope and to be resilient, but um, it's nice to, you know, it's definitely helpful to have the university there to offer support too. Because it matters. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to learn when you're, you're thinking about when you're also hungry, as you know. Absolutely. Um, sorry, I'm looking at some, some questions that I had. Uh, sure. What unique challenges did you experience perhaps as a graduate student? Um, I have two part, you know, is there any unique challenges as an undergrad and unique challenges as a graduate student? Can you differentiate those or are they yeah. very similar to you? I mean, so yes and no. I mean, for me, like I was at the same campus, right? But the feel of the graduate university at UCR is very different than the undergrad, right? You know, as an undergrad, I was in all the undergrad things. I was in ASUCR. I was a tour guide right i got to show people the campus because when people are visiting campus and doing tours they're usually coming into the undergrad program um and then you know with undergrad your program is, is structured right so i think the biggest challenge for me was you know as a first gen student like those the, the set of challenges that are common to first gen students were were definitely the ones i experienced right like how do you transition from high school to college i was also going through some family stuff where like you know i essentially lost my family support um, and i was on my own so that was a really trying time, um, but I had had some support. I'm I was a proud alum of the TRIO Upward Bound program uh, at UC Riverside. Oh, yes. So I had a community in place already. Um, Alex Cortez, who works at UCR now, um, was there. Uh, several other individuals who were there to like watch out for me and also be you know a, a shoulder to cry on, but also people to celebrate with. Um, so that was the, the undergrad part. Graduate school is a different beast, right? Um, because graduate school, you're not just learning, what you're doing is creating knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. um, and UCR did a great job of preparing me, but I still felt, you know, the, the community is different, right? A lot of the graduate students came from different backgrounds. So it wasn't, you know, a whole bunch of first gen low income students anymore. You know, you had students who, whose family had been professors or had been medical doctors or had higher education. 
So I found myself like even at social events, like having to study before I went to those things um, because I was oh. just like, okay, I, I don't even have like this level yet. Um, and there was a few other people that, uh, you know, I connected with in the program that you know, we, we were all kind of first gen or had similar experiences. Um, and, you know, really trying to figure out how to navigate that, you know, because you're still first gen, right? You're first gen in, in your PhD program and you're trying to figure that out. Um, and things, things are different, right? The social events, there was a lot of stuff on birding and a lot of stuff on, you know, where science was the, the, the conversation, right? Um, and that wasn't something I grew up with and that wasn't something that I experienced in my day-to-day -day community, a really formal discussion of science. Um, so having to learn to navigate that, uh, I think is, is a big challenge, uh, was a big challenge. Um, but, you know, the opportunity there is I had to learn to navigate in environments that I wasn't familiar with. Um, and that's been incredibly helpful for my post UCR career, right? Like I've gone to community organizing, I moved to New York in a very short amount of time, um, you know, between putting in my notice and starting those 13 days. So, um, wow. and then coming to DC where things are shifting regularly and frequently and quickly, um, learning how to navigate unfamiliar environments and, and thrive in them uh, has been incredibly valuable. So, um, can I, can I ask you a follow-up question, what yeah. I think is unique, unique to first-gen students? I mean, we hear about this from the undergraduate level, but how did your family respond to you going to graduate school and you're getting your PhD? Because I right. think, you know, it's not just the undergrad, but the fact that you went on to get an advanced degree. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did they no, respond so, to this? Yeah, no, so I think I mentioned there were some family um, issues. So, like, I'm not really in touch with my parents, but my grandparents who were on the shelf behind me. Um, were like, you know, they're, they're, they're the greatest. Uh, um, they were incredibly supportive, right? Um, you know, they would ask questions, they would talk about things. Um, I, my grandmother would always be like, I don't know what you just said, uh, but that sounds amazing. But that was actually a chance for me to learn, right? Because it was like, okay, well, I want my grandmother to understand what I said. Um, you know, because the research I'm doing matters, but if, if the public doesn't understand the research that we're doing, then we're never gonna convince people that we need to spend you know, literally billions of dollars like nationwide on this, um, or why it's important to do research on crickets, uh, which is what I was working on, right? So it actually forced me to really think about like, well, how do I frame this? Not to dumb it down, but to like frame it in a way that resonated with my grandmother. Um, and my grandparents came to my dissertation defense, right? I was really Aww. purposeful about my dissertation defense. I invited lots of people from my community, um, including the trio folks. Um, and I had to be very cognizant of the fact that a lot of people coming to my defense then were not scientists um, and, and weren't practicing scientists. Um, and so the, how do I create a dissertation defense that still speaks to that high level of research that's needed to get to get your PhD, but also was accessible to the community that I, that I wanted there with me. Um, so the community was incredibly supportive, right? My friends and my family were always very supportive. They challenged me in new ways to think about how to present research. Um, and to think about the implications and, and why it mattered. Um, but they also had really great ideas. I remember like one amazing talk I gave at community college uh, during my fourth or fifth year of graduate school, you know, the class was mostly older individuals, right? People were going back to school because they had dropped out for some reason. They had families um, and all that. And they had the most amazing questions. And some of those questions became parts of my dissertation. <laughs> Uh, because I didn't have an answer, right? But they were asking these incredible questions um, that really changed the focus of my research. So uh, I think my family and, and community were very supportive, um, and even more so once I figured out how to frame it in a way that that worked with their their frame of reference. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so as so as an alum, as someone who's you know has who is a proud Highlander. Um, what is it that, you know, that I can do and that other alums can do to support the college, um, the legacy of UCR, the legacy of CNAS, but also like, how do we be supportive at this incredibly challenging time? Oh my gosh, that's a big question. <laughs> so let me start with, uh, I'll, I, I'll say it's easy, but I don't know if it is, uh, just coming back and sharing your stories with their students. I think that is incredibly powerful as again, you know, uh, more than 50% of our students are first generation, more than 50% of our students are Pell Grant eligible, which are uncertain. Um, and a lot of our students, both undergrads and graduate students are food insecure. So 
having somebody like you to come back and share their stories of success to show that one, UCR creates this wonderful environment, prepares you to do amazing things once you leave campus and go on to do other things, and that you care enough about to come back and share your story with them. That alone and just say engaging and, and, and sharing, I think goes a long way. Um, helping us in again in any way of of networking and connecting in a broader way um i probably would i have a list of uh political connections i'd like to make but i won't i won't uh i won't hit with this with us right now um but i do have to say you know with the financial situation that a lot of our students come in are in you know if there's ways that people can can support us in that way you know uh every little bit helps whether that's uh, giving us your time, uh, giving us a, a, some money that may, may help somebody with their, their stipend or with their food or anything else. So at this, pretty much anything that alumnus can do to support us is gonna be, is, is gonna be helpful. And, and we're grateful for everything that you can do. Thank you for sharing that. Now, I'm a proud donor, um, but I know there's so many alums doing amazing things. You know, I, I've been able to talk, reconnect with several recently. You know, Swan Gordon, who was also out of the EEOB program, is doing incredible things in St. Louis um, and, and speaking, you know, on, on what it's like to be a black woman in academia, um, especially at a time, you know, like right now in the, the wake of, of, of murders of unarmed black people. Um, so that's been a big deal. Brianna Harris has been writing really great papers on what it's like to be a woman and a caretaker um, and how that affects productivity in science. So. There's, you know, UCR alums are, are out there doing big things and, and changing the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to kick off this, but I'm, you know, I'm hoping that you get to hear from all of these incredible individuals that are doing just amazing things out there. Well, it's so inspiring. Again, sometimes when it seems like the news is really bad, really bad, it's really inspiring to bring in people who've made it happen, even under tough circumstances. So I know that we're almost done, but I did have one last question that I want to ask you. Sure. So if you had a magic wand, <laughs> uh, what changes would you like to see at UCR? Oh my gosh, that's, that's a tough one. I mean, I think- It is a tough I would, one. <laughs> I would love to solve the problem you identified at the very end, right? Like I would love to just wave a magic wand and give UCR this massive endowment, right? Like just <laughs> big endowment. That's good. You know, and we can support students and we can make sure that the campus, you know, does all the things that matter for equity, right? Um, that would be, I think, you know, I would love to do that. Um, and I, I mean, UCR does so much of this on its own already. Like the profile of UCR, it's, it's always one of those, when I started UCR many, many years ago, the campus, uh, the view that like we always heard in the popular media about Riverside wasn't maybe the most positive, right? Um, but it's definitely changed, right? And I, I think, mm. you know, UCR was always this amazing place. That hasn't changed. But what's changed is how people view it. Um, and that, that's a testament to the work that you've done, that the faculty have done, that the graduate students and the undergrads have done, um, you know, now and then the ones that will come forward or that will do. Um, so I think the reputation has definitely improved. But I would love to see people think about Riverside because they should in the same breath that they think about any elite institution, right? But the difference I want, people to understand is that, you know, elite institutions often are exclusive, right? Mm -hmm. um, and have a history of exclusivity. Um, and I really, you know, like that's the sort of thing that I really appreciate about Riverside is there's, a, there's been a focus on in inclusivity, right? So you can be elite and be inclusive. Um, and mm -hmm. in fact, you can, be, you can be a stronger, more robust, more responsive university by being inclusive. So um, kudos to the work that's going on. I would love to just like make that more visible to, to the world. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. So yeah, so we got to figure out the bright. So maybe uh, when you're asking me what you can get well, all the alumnus, we got to tell them, tell them our story and make sure that they share our story too, so we can hear about. It. So we're all really proud of what's going on here. Hmm. So so Catherine and Oops. Brian, this is Debron. I yes. wish we had more time. I love this conversation, but I do want to allow uh, just a bit for the Q and A. Um, we've had yeah. some questions submitted, and I'd like to to get into some of those. So. Uh, okay. This first question is actually for you, Brian. Yeah. So to what extent do you feel that UCR has prepared you for life after college and after grad school? 
Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a loaded question, right? But I think it's done a great job preparing. I think I, I, touched, I touched on this earlier, right? Like the learning how to navigate unfamiliar environments. Um, but I think the other big thing has been building a community, right? Um, I chose I chose UC Riverside as an undergraduate student. I, ha I got into every single college I applied to. Um, and it came down to Berkeley and Riverside. Uh, and I chose Riverside because I felt a sense of community there. And that was really, really important. Um, so that, that was really good. Like having that community matters, right? Like having technical expertise is, is important too, right? But relationships matter and having a community that you believe in and that supports you too is really critical. And so both my undergraduate career and my graduate career at UC Riverside, um, I really had a chance to build significant, meaningful relationships with people that, that matter. Yeah, I'm still in touch with lots of people. I just saw a comment from Irma Ortiz, um, you know, like, I, I love connecting with her. When she was out here in DC, we, we, we met up and we talked about Congress. Um, Al, Alex Cortez, who's been a mentor since I, was the eight, since I was 15 and so someone I really looked up to, but faculty as well. The faculty connections were so big. Uh, Rich Cardulo and Kim Hammond, um, really guided me through graduate school, right? There are moments where, you know, like I struggled with mental health. Um, I struggled, with, you know, being a low income first gen student. You know, there were a lot of challenges that I faced that, you know, at times I, I wanted to stop. I wanted to, to, to leave, um, not because the environment was bad, because I, I was really struggling, right? Um, and Kim and Rich were just so supportive they they weren't trying to fix things what they're trying to do is give me a, a venue to be heard and to be listened to um and so that was just so critical and there, there are people i still I, I still stay in touch with um mm -hmm. and that's so critical i think the the biggest thing that ucr did was help me foster a sense of community and i think that's one of the real true strengths of the campus uh, uh at riverside is just the community is so strong i i agree and thank you for sharing that um the next question is actually from Olivia, and this is for you, Catherine, or Dean Urich. Um, could you describe what the different challenges that students are facing at the undergraduate and graduate level? The different challenges, during I'd say for, yes, during this particular time. So for undergrads, <laughs> uh, I would say, I, I, I talked about the, the idea of a study space, but that I think the social interactions is really important. Uh, the ability to make connections because, I mean, Brian, you might agree, I think you might agree, a lot of people, is that when you go to college, you're meeting people who you've never had connections with before, and so you're kind of starting from scratch and building relationships. And the fact that you're sh sitting in a classroom together or sitting in a dorm together or eating together, you're developing new types of relationships outside your normal community. So I see that's a challenge with the undergrads. For the graduate students, I think the challenge is a feeling of, again, uh, of isolation. And so there are some graduate students who are going into the laboratory and doing research, but we're doing it on schedules. So we're being pretty restrictive. So people can go in the lab and do their research or go wherever to do their research, but it's in a very controlled manner. So there's not the, you know, it's two in the morning, my experiment isn't working, I'm having my cup of coffee and I'm sitting around, you know, complaining about machine broke down again. It's just not happening under these times because it's not safe to do it. So it's interesting because the, uh, what I find is that the, the, the difficulty is that that social, that personal face-to-face uh, -face connection and interaction. I think those are the biggest challenges at both levels in different ways. Absolutely. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, we had another question submitted. This one's from, from Chris. So with all the changes that are going on that you discussed due to COVID-19, Catherine, um, how would you define the status of CNAS right now? And if you can elaborate on your vision for CNAS for the next five years. Oh. <laughs> so this is a tough question. Um, not, that, not at the vision. I mean, the, the difficulty, oh. how can I go? What was hap What I would say in February 2020 is just completely what I would say right now. It's just the world is, I mean, this is, it's, I'm stating the obvious, the world is so different. So in February 2020, we had all these plans. I was absolutely going to do X, Y, and Z. 
but then, you know, the world changes and you need to accommodate. Um, and so I've been shifting into the bigger pictures is how are we going to do research? Because we're doing research differently now. So how are we going to make sure that people do research in a way that's safe and effective for graduate students as well as for undergraduate students? How are we going to be teaching? And that is just fundamentally different. Um, we as a community at UCR, certainly the administrators of the faculty are thinking, you know, we're rethinking what does it mean to be a UCR in the time of COVID now, because this is going to take a couple of years for things to, to work itself out. Uh, but there will be a vaccine. We will overcome this. And what's going to be different, uh, we're going to be teaching differently. We're going to be doing research differently. But what is clear, um, we, we need to be, again, in planning for resilience. We're going to be doing a lot more research. Our research is going to be done differently and our teaching is going to be done differently. So we're having a lot of conversations about what that means. Um, I can dig down into specifics, but I don't, we only have really a few minutes, but um, I'll just say overall, um, I am, maybe it's because I'm a first generation student and the reason I went to college is because I had research experience. So the enabling the teaching as well as the research for our, our first generation undergraduate students as well as our graduate students making sure that this is open for everybody is a is a priority so it's research but it's not just research because in a research in your lab you develop your community it's your second family it's your other family so that there's something that is just really critical uh, and empowering and enriching so uh, a focus is how do we how do we develop our graduate program? How do we grow our graduate program? How do we grow and expand it in a way uh, that's COVID robust, uh, that is gonna continue on beyond COVID? Perfect. Um, and we have one last question that was submitted, and this one's for Brian, and I think um, the attendee was referring to maybe what you talked about earlier with sense of community, but what type of access do you have with the Congresswoman? And can you talk a little bit about the community, if there is one that you have in DC? Exactly. Yeah, no, yes. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, I work for the Congresswoman as part of a team, right? Um, it, we see her every day. I mean, not for now, obviously, like we're all working remotely, but, um, you know, as, as a fellow, you're part of the team and you're expected to, to do a lot. Um, and that's, that's a good thing, right? You want a chance to like do the real work as opposed to, you know, doing something that is um, maybe doesn't have, have as much uh, impact on the legislative side. Um, so there's a lot of interaction, and it's not just with the congressman, it's with the rest of the team, right? I work directly for our senior health policy advisor, um, who's, you know, 26 and brilliant and knows everything about health, and so I'm always just trying to keep up with her, right? Um, but I get a chance to work with the entire team to, to really try to, you know, move things forward for the congressman so that she has what she needs to do her job effectively. Um, and Deron, I forgot the second part of that question, so I wonder, could you just repeat that? Was it about community in D.C.? Yeah, like the, the type of community you may have there in DC. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was a really big strength of the AAAS program, if I give that a shout out. Like, you, you come in with like 300 other fellows, right? 300 other scientists and engineers, um, and they're placed all over the government, right? So it's not just with Congress or with one agency, you're like everywhere. So that helps. That was a really good way to kind of kickstart the community. Um, but I reached out to people that I knew, right? Like, there's uh, someone I met when I studied abroad um, at UCR, um, and I studied abroad in Costa Rica, and I knew i kept in touch with those folks and one of them lived in dc so one of my first weekends here she was like come out i'm going to show you all the different neighborhoods and so we walked around the city mm -hmm. um ucdc is a really big thing so there's a bunch of uc alums who are involved with ucdc so ucdc is like study abroad but in dc um so you like undergrads live on campus and intern on the hill or with a foundation um so that's been really big like you get to meet a lot of the other alums who are mentors um but you get to meet the new students um, I always search out the Riverside ones. Riverside doesn't have the largest representation at UCDC, and I'm hoping to change that, but I always look for the Riverside people, and I'm like, okay, I need to know you, and we need to communicate, um, because I want you to be you know, a, a Highlander that thrives and gets everything you need out of this. Um, but I've also had a chance to, to just connect with really great people. Um, there's a lot of Californians here. Uh, DC is you know, a transient city. There's people from all over. Uh, I was at one event for work, um, a conference, and I remember complaining about the tacos they had. They were, they were truly horrible. Um, and somebody like two spots away in line was like, oh my God, they're so bad, right? 
Um, and it turned out she was from LA. I was from, you know, the Inland Empire. So we like clicked immediately and we we're just like, oh my gosh, yes, we can bond over our, our hatred of DC tacos. Um, <laughs> But you know that was a chance to build a network there too. Um, so I have a really strong network of people now. Um, you know I have a, a group of friends. Uh, we call ourselves Scandalgate. Um, we don't do anything scandalous, I promise. But um, you know they're like my they're my family here, right? Like we have dinner together. We haven't had dinner in several months, but we would have regular dinners together. We are always checking in on each other. You know we celebrate our lives. We celebrate our life's uh, challenges and. Um, and, and successes together, right? So DC is a really cool city for doing that. Everyone's here to change the world. Everyone wants to do something incredible. Um, politics are a real part of it, right? So that's that's a challenge, right? Navigating that minefield, but um, everyone wants to do big things. And so it's a really great place to meet people um, and and do really cool things and build a, new, build a community that enhances your own community already. I hope Brian, I we that question justice. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it was great. Uh, I just want, also want to give a shout out. Uh, we had our very own Tracy Khan mention how exciting it is to hear your story and see you, see you guys at work. <laughs> Tracy's yeah. amazing. And Tracy, like if you're on, I, I love that you're on Gastropod. Um, I actually like emailed oh, yeah. the producers of Gastropod and I was like, Tracy's amazing and thank you for having her because like she does such cool work. Um, but yeah, Tracy's one of those people in the community like that I got that I was fortunate enough to be a part of the UCR community and interact with her. You know, I got to teach uh, Biology 30 um, and, you know, sit in on her class when she taught it because she's, you know, a master at it. So um, shout out to Tracy for all the incredible work that she does. So thank you, Tracy. <laughs> thank you, Brian. Well, I see our time has come to a quick close. That was really fast. And uh, I find it interesting. You were supposed to be talking about science, which we did, but we actually spent a lot of time talking about a community and engagement and in people. And so that's, that's, that's really heartwarming too, because that's what it's about. If you're, not, if you're not doing the great science, if you're not building the policy, you want to make sure that it has an impact and it matters. So Brian, oh, I want to... I think... <laughs> No, I think it connects with what you said. People do science, right? Science does not happen by itself. People do science. And if we're not treating our people right, nothing, nothing works. So um, I think the, the sense of community is really critical. And I appreciate all that you're doing to help foster that at the website. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for uh, being the, ex the experimental, the lab rat for this <laughs> experiment. Anything uh, for our first ever inaugural Lex Talk Science. It was real. I really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you for the entire uh, attendees and participants who I can't see. I do see some questions and some feed that we're getting. It looks like it was pretty positive. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, we look forward to the next event, which will be the next quarter. And so again, Brian, really impressive. We're so proud of you and everything that you've done. So please thank come so back much. virtually <laughs> or in, in real person. So everybody to, else. <laughs> Please stay safe and we will see you again. Thank you all. Be well. Be well.